So today I want to work on this 486-386 board, which I found during one of my trips to the scrapyard. I tried to find out what this board is all about, because it has a socket that looks a little bit different. It has a 486 and a 386 socket. And there are just a few questions that I have. Unfortunately, when we go to the retro web, there is not much information about this board. There is just a image that outlines the board and there is a jumper manual. In here, we don't get too much information about it. It is a Forex Computer Corporation. I've never heard about that company, to be honest. There are a few connectors uh, described and then we go into I have more about this JP6 uh, to say later. So this is the CMOS clear jumper that is here. Then we have memory configuration, what is supported. We have cache configuration and uh, which uh, type of CPU is installed. And that is it. There is not even a actual picture of this board, which I can supply later on. And I can also supply a BIOS image because there are none. So apparently this board supports front side bus speeds up to 50 megahertz. We have cache size possibilities of 64, 128 and 256. Max memory is here given at 32 megabytes. RAM type most likely is FPM. And there is not much other information here. So it is a bit unfortunate that there is not a lot of information for this board. But anyway, we need to find out if this board actually works. So now it's time to fix this battery damage. I want to take a moment to thank our sponsor for today's video, PCBWay. They offer a wide variety of services including CNC machining, 3D printing, sheet metal fabrication and injection molding. My go-to service from PCBWay, however, is their outstanding PCB manufacturing. Their turnaround time is incredibly fast and the quality is constantly top-notch. Thanks to PCBWay, I have been able to create memory expansion modules for Voodoo cards, high-capacity memory modules and voltage regulators. If you need any of these services, I highly recommend checking out PCBWay.com. And by using the link in the video description, you'll also be supporting this channel and the work I do. Thanks PCBWay for your continued support.
Okay, and now it's time to apply the solder mask. And then put it outside in the sun for like 10-15 minutes to let it cure. So I'm using yellow solder mask here to well, have it somehow look like the original, but obviously it's not as if it would not have been fixed, but this is as close as I can get this. So the solder mask I got from AliExpress and I'm really, really happy with it. Um, I also got the UV light with it, but uh, that was not as good as I expected. I would absolutely recommend putting this solder mask under the sun. It takes maybe 10, 15 minutes to fully cure. It's, it's just different uh, than the battery powered LED UV light. Okay, I think that's it. I'll put this now outside under the sun and I'll be back once uh, this is cured. So... Perfect. And now we wait. Some people ask me what type of solder wire am I using and I wish I could provide a link to this product but unfortunately this is Balvatin made in Germany and it was made in 1998. I don't think they make this anymore but even though this is 25 years old it works great and every time I'm soldering something I use this wire. Luckily, I still have quite a bit of wire left. I'm pretty sure this is going to last me for a very, very long time. But yeah, every time you see me solder something, I most likely use this wire. And I think it fits to my channel. I mean, retro hardware, retro solder wire. Why not? Let's have a look at the charging circuit of this motherboard. Here we had a chargeable battery and this provided some power to the BIOS chip when the board was powered off. But I will not replace the old battery with a new chargeable battery. I want to have a button cell battery here. Um, these are not chargeable and that's why uh, we have to disable the charging circuit. I'll put a picture on the screen with the pinout of the power adapter here. But if I'm not mistaken, in the middle here, this is all ground. They should all be connected together. I think these are four pins. Yes, and then we have, I think this is something else. I don't know right now. But these three on the right side uh, should be five volts. All three. Yes. So let's just see where this five volts goes to. It's, in the end, it has to end up somewhere here. And you can see here there's a plus for the battery. Somehow we should end up here, on this, on this uh, pad. But if I go, yeah. So there is no, there is no direct connectivity. It probably goes through these resistors and diodes somewhere, and um, we can go two ways. We can go backwards. I think this is uh, what I would prefer doing. Um, in the end, we should end up at the power connector. So first, this is the trace that we repaired. I put a wire in here and it goes to this. There was a pin header. So we have a connectivity here. Uh, I think these two are connected. I checked this before. These two are ground. Yes. So these two are ground on the right. The next one here is our plus terminal from the battery and this next to it. I don't know where this goes, but this is um, the external battery connector. So I assume this is the positive terminal of the external battery that also goes through the circuit here, powers the BIOS chip and uh, is not charged by the circuit. So what we could do is, I didn't think of that and I'm not sure you can let me know in the comments if that would have been a better option. We could have just not connect this wire back to where it originally connects to. We could have just connected it to the external battery. But 
in case somebody still hooks up an external battery later on and we have a button cell battery here, then there would be another problem. Let's keep the board as is. So if somebody goes ahead and expects some circuitry to be behaving in a certain way, it behaves exactly as it should have been originally. So then this connector goes probably somewhere to these uh, components here. No, not to this resistor. Okay, here we have uh, 153 ohms, but this is not a direct connection. Also not a direct connection, but here we also get uh, the same resistance. So these two probably are connected together, yes. Uh, but it's not our our connector from the battery, also not. So let's check the other side because we have some resistance here everywhere. No. Oh. So here we are. This is our new point of reference. We go through this resistor and go through it. So this is a 150... Uh, I guess 150 ohm resistor. Uh, where do we go next? No, not here, but we already checked these two are connected together. So here we go through a diode. So let's see where this one goes. So this diode lets electricity in or current in. So let's see if this is our connection to the 5 volt rail. Wow, exactly zero ohms, that doesn't sound right. So my leads are 0 0.3 usually. Ah, here we go. So sorry for all the beeping, but this is our charging circuit. So this one comes in and goes through this resistor and goes back to our battery. So this is basically what pulls up the battery current and will end up on our plus terminal. But I don't want to just go ahead and disable uh, or remove this diode here right now. I want to actually see how it behaves. So we are going to power up this board now without any CPU or memory. This gives the advantage that we can test the board first and see where are maybe other problems. For instance, we have tantalum capacitors that I have seen other <laughs> Uh, YouTubers and friends uh, where these ones blow up, so I have to be a little bit careful about those. And otherwise, um, we can then measure the voltage we get here. And I would expect that... Um, let's quickly check the, the diode. We have a voltage drop of 0 0.6 volts approximately, so I would expect we get 4.3, 4.4 volts on this terminal here when the board is powered up. So let's have a look. So our board is now plugged in, but I do not have memory installed. I do not have a CPU installed and the BIOS chip is also not there. So now comes the moment of truth and I go to protect myself a little bit because I do not trust this board. Let's see what happens. Okay, uh, power supply is on, nothing exploded, uh, that looks like the board actually works. So let's uh, turn it back on and uh, measure some voltages. Okay, so I'm expecting here 4.3 volts if I'm not mistaken. Oh, I'm in the wrong mode, sorry, sorry, here we go. So I'm expecting here on our battery terminal now 5 volts minus the voltage drop of the diode, 4.4 approximately. Okay, so we get a little bit higher, a higher voltage here, but definitely the board is charging the battery, 4.75 volts. And this is coming from here, so let's see, this one here should be our 5 volts. So 5 volts from the power supply. Wow, that is spot on. Okay, 5 volts from the power supply. Here we have the 4.7 volts, which is going to be on our battery terminal. Okay, 
4.75 volts. Of course, this one we need to disable, and I believe if we go ahead and uh, remove this diode, this will be our fix, disabling the charging circuit. So I decided to desolder the diode that we have here to break the charging circuit. And um, now we can check if we still receive five volts on the plus terminal, it should be almost zero. On the retro web, there is a little bit of documentation for this board, um, which also includes something about this jumper. This is the CMOS clear jumper, JP6. Unfortunately, in the documentation, it says you have to connect this for uh, normal operation, but that's not true. If you short these two pins, you're clearing the CMOS. So we have to keep that open, but we'll see now what voltage we get on our battery terminal. Let's test this quickly with a multimeter. Let's power on the board. So let's see if we still get our five volts here. Yes, this is from the power supply. And before on the battery terminal, we had four point something. But now because the diode is gone, the battery terminal does no longer receive the voltage coming from our power supply. So we successfully disabled the charging circuit. This is actually the board that had our AMD CPU that's a little bit discolored in the center in it. I guess we'll also find out if this CPU still works. So then let's install our CPU. Just make sure pin number one lines up with pin number one on the motherboard. Oh, it will be so difficult to get the CPU out again, but maybe we'll just leave it forever in there. I also need to install the BIOS chip. I already made a backup of the content and will submit it to the RetroWeb. Also here we have to make sure that we have the correct pin alignment. Okay. It's also back on the board. And we will install 16 megabytes of system memory. These are memory sticks that I created some time ago. And these are four megabytes each. Okay, so the board is back together and I will move it over to the test bench in a moment. But before we power on and test this board, I want to show you something that I have been holding on for a while now. It is a creation of one of my viewers. And I'm curious if you would see value in this and if this would make things a lot easier for you. If you have worked with old retro hardware, then you know that sometimes finding a keyboard that is compatible with DIN or PS2, it is quite difficult. Most of us these days have USB keyboards or mice, but unfortunately those are not compatible with the old PS2 and DIN 5 standards. And for this, there is now a solution. This adapter takes in your USB signal and converts it into a PS2 signal. So you can use any of your USB keyboards with this adapter on systems like this 486 we have today. And to make it work, the only thing that you have to do is to plug in your USB cable or, in my case, a Logitech receiver into the USB port. And then you can decide if you want to have it connected to a PS2 port with this cable. Or if you have a DIN5 connector like on our motherboard today, then you can even add another adapter to translate PS2 to DIN5. And now you can connect your USB keyboard to our 486-386 motherboard. I will show you how this works in a moment and I think it's really fantastic. But let me know in the comments if you would be interested in something like this and if you think this would solve a major problem you have with your old retro hardware. So everything is set up. I connected the USB keyboard to the adapter and this one is connected to the motherboard. And uh, we are powering on the system for the very first time. And I'm really curious if we get a picture. So. Let's try. Ha, yes. Okay, so first, as you can see, I use an ET4000 as a graphics card with one megabyte of display memory. And yeah, the bio settings are not there. CMOS display type mismatch, okay. And we have the system utility. So now let's see if this keyboard actually works. Haha. <laughs> Okay, so here you have your little adapter. 
that transmits USB keyboard signals to a DIN 5 on a 386-486 motherboard. Now let's continue with the BIOS. Let's change the colors a little bit. I like the blue one, this one. So, okay, we have to set our date. It is set to 1980. It's July 23. This BIOS looks very similar to the BIOS I have on my other 386 system. So I wonder if this is actually the same. But uh, let's see. Okay, we have a floppy drive installed. And we have VGA options. Yeah, VGA. And keyboard is installed. What do we have in advanced? Okay, this is keyboard stuff. Numeric coprocessor is there. It's a 486. DX2. Oh, yeah, how uh, AMD CPU works, by the way, even though it's discolored in the center. System boot C. I hooked up a small SD card that has MS DOS pre installed and has all the benchmark tools that I will run in a moment. External cache is on. Turbo switch function. Yes, this one. So, turbo switch is sometimes a very tricky feature. If you forget to set your jumper or you leave this option enabled, disabled in the BIOS, you will have a super slow system. So I will try when I'm running the benchmarks to run it in the normal mode, meaning that the 486 should run at its normal frequency and with all the capabilities enabled. Um, but more about this probably later because I don't know how this board implements the turbo switch functionality. What I understood is there are different ways how a system can be slowed down. For instance, you could disable the level one cache, which is possible with the 486. But a 386 doesn't have a level 1 cache, so maybe it disables the onboard cache, maybe it reduces the system bus frequency. Right now we are running at 33 megahertz. maybe it clocks it down to 20 or some other value. So I will uh, have a look at this and I will let you know how this is implemented on this board. What do we have here? Uh, a T bus, so if we have uh, 33 megahertz, that divided by five, that would be six point something. So I think this is uh, divider is too high. 33 divided by four is eight, eight, eight 8.25. So I think this is one what we have to have set up here. Then we have DRAM weight states. I think we can go low on this one. These are pretty fast memory sticks i think i ran them like this cache i don't know these are 20 nanosecond cache chips on the board i will probably leave it like this and then we have the local bus option so this one is something that a lot of you reached out to me on the board is this one socket that has a different color it's brown all the other isa slots are black after i cleaned the board i could read on that socket eisa bus but this was an open standard. However, on this board, it looks like there is the Opti local bus implemented, which uses the same slot, but it is not compatible. Physically it is, but electrically it's not. Some people reached out to me and shared their experience with the extended ISA bus. And unfortunately, some of them also got caught by this problem that these two bus types look identical physically, but they're electrically different. And they ended up ruining either a graphics card or ruined their board. And I do not want to risk it, so I will leave this completely out. Uh, shout out to Atheatos, who actually told me, do not plug anything in this slot. So we'll not risk it, and that's why I will also disable this. I'm firmly believing that this controls the brown slot on the motherboard. So we'll leave this disabled. And that is all there is. Let's just quickly auto detect the hard drive. 32 megabytes. Yes, that's right. And there is nothing on the second drive connector. And that's it. So I will go ahead and run some benchmarks now and I will let you know once I'm done with it. Also, a big shout out to Phil from Phil's Computer Lab for providing this little benchmark pack. It is amazingly simple to have all these benchmarks in one place. 
And let me know what you think about this uh, adapter. And if you're interested in a full video about this adapter with its full capabilities and features, and we will try to get this ready, that it is going to be available to everyone in the retro community. So now let's talk a little bit about benchmarks. I thought this would be quite easy, but I was very mistaken. First, I tried to figure out how much of a slowdown we get when the turbo feature is off. And as you can see, PC Player looks like a slideshow and finishes with a score of 3 frames per second. And the same is true for Doom. And although the game performs a little bit better, we still remain below 5 frames per second. And in cache check, we can finally see how this board implements the turbo feature. The access time up to 128 kilobytes remains identical. So that means we don't have any level 1 cache. This is confirmed by the summary displayed at the end of the benchmark. Another tool for checking the available caches is Speedsys. The graph on the right shows a drop in performance at 128 kilobytes, the size of the cache installed on the motherboard. And our CPU scored 11.39 points in the processor benchmark, sitting comfortably between a 386DX40 and a 486DX250. I want to bring this to your attention that this CPU performs better than a 386DX40 before we go to the next benchmark. Which is… System information. And here, things suddenly turned upside down. We get a score for our CPU without the turbo feature switched on that is lower than an Intel 386DX33. Something doesn't add up. The CPU seems to be still clocked at 66MHz. The only thing we did was to disable the level 1 cache. A 3D6 also doesn't have a level 1 cache. However, we are clocked at twice the frequency, so I would expect a score of around 70 points. Of course, I reran the other benchmarks, and you can imagine that I was quite surprised when I got different results. The system felt faster. Here are just two examples. Top bench increased from 55 to 76 points. And the access time in cache check reduced from 78 to 40 microseconds. What is going on? I tried to figure out what happened, but I could not reproduce the lower scores we got in the initial benchmark runs. The only way how I could get them back was to reboot the system. I didn't want to spend much more time on this problem because, well, maybe it's an issue with the turbo feature implementation. So I continued to gather benchmark results, but this time with the turbo feature switched on. So the system should deliver its best performance. And it kind of did. In Speedsys, the system scores 24.72 points. I think this is adequate for the system. And on the right in the graph, we see the drops at 8 kilobytes, which is the level 1 cache, and at 128 kilobytes, which is the cache on the motherboard. PC Player finishes now with 7.3 and Doom slightly above 15 frames per second. And in cache check, we can clearly see the different cache levels at 8 and 128 kilobytes. Anything above is the system memory. The summary at the end of the test shows us that we have now two caches available. Okay, so everything is good now, isn't it? Unfortunately, no. When I started system information, I got a score. But not one that I expected. 21.8! It's still slower than an Intel 386DX33. The score moved up by a little bit more than one point. That can't be right. But 21.8 points was the highest score I got on this system. No matter what I tried. And the problem was that all the other benchmarks changed their score again. But this time, they got worse. Top bench, for instance, reduced from 135 points to 77 points. Now I was totally confused. So I reached out to my friend, Tony. You may know him from Tony359, the YouTube channel. By the way, if you haven't, you should definitely check out his videos. I learned so much from his debugging skills, his reasoning why things don't work, and finding solutions. So I asked him if he came across something similar. And after a little bit back and forth, we came to the conclusion that there must be an issue in the implementation, or maybe a bug in the BIOS. And although we couldn't figure out what the problem was, I could sing out the application that was responsible for this weird behavior. It's system information. The one with a very low score. Hmm. Every time I opened this application, and really opening was enough, it messed up the scores of all the other benchmarks. When the turbo feature was disabled, the system performed better after opening system information, and worse when the turbo feature was enabled. 
and this behavior is only observable with system information. So unfortunately, I had to cut this tool loose. But even if you give the system the best possibility to perform well, it just disappoints. Those are benchmark results from my previous video, when I tried the original Tomb Raider on the Socket 3 platform. We need to focus on the light blue bars, which are the scores of an Intel DX266. A very similar CPU to what we have in our system today. The Intel system scored 11 frames per second in the PC Player benchmark. Our system today scored only 7.3. Doom is very playable on the Intel CPU. But with our system today and a little bit over 15 frames per second, you will definitely see some stutters. In top bench, our system today scores about 50 points less, at 135. And I don't even want to mention system information. You have seen the score of 21.8. The only benchmark where the value somehow makes sense is Speedsys. Our system scored 24.72 points today which is very close to the 25.05 points of the Intel DX266. So in almost all benchmarks, our system today performed significantly worse. But what could be the reason? I tried so many things. I even replaced the AMD CPU with an Intel DX266. But I got the same results. Then I checked the manual. I went through all the jumper settings and made sure that everything on the board is configured correctly but I didn't find any problems. And I also measured the bus frequency with an oscilloscope, but that was spot on at 33 MHz. So what could be the reason for the poor performance of today's system? Well, there are a couple of things to consider. First, today's board is limited to ISA slots only. That means we also need to use an ISA video card. The Soyo board I used for the other benchmarks had PCI slots, and if I'm not mistaken, I used a Tseng ET6000 as a graphics card. Furthermore, the Soyo board had 72 pin memory sockets, whereas today's board is limited to 30 pin SIM modules. But I don't believe this to be a major issue, because both systems work only with FPM memory. So, now I'm curious what you have to say. Do you have any idea why this system performs so poorly? Could the poor performance be an issue with those mixed socket type boards, where you have a 386 and a 486 on the same motherboard? Maybe the BIOS has some limitations, but a BIOS update is out of the question, because there are none. The only BIOS image I have is the one I took off this board, which I need to upload to the RetroWeb now. As always, let me know your thoughts in the comments. And finally, I want to thank all my Patreons for their invaluable support, and you for your time to watch this video. Thanks for watching and I will see you in one of my other videos.